I'd like to start with the story that Alison just mentioned, which is the story of the Supreme Court ruling in favor of Monsanto in their suit against Berman Bowman. Those of you following the case will remember that Bowman had purchased second generation seeds from a grain elevator, which are typically cheaper and used in riskier late season crops destined for animal feed. The court ruled that he had broken the law because he planted seeds which naturally yielded from the original patented seed products. As the journalist explains, and as Dr. Gupta reminded us this morning, and as many of you already know, Monsanto's policies prohibit farmers from saving or reusing seeds from Monsanto-born crops. Farmers who use Monsanto seeds are forced to buy high-priced new seeds every year. The story highlights the ways in which the logic of the market colludes with and reinforces, if it does not indeed demand, what we usually think of as the biological character of annual as opposed to perennial crops, that each year they require planting anew. Outrage felt at Monsanto and at a system of corporate agriculture that takes away farmers' abilities to save their seeds, concerns I want to suggest not just the injustice, the injustice of new forms of economic dependence and servitude created by such expropriation as knowledge is transferred into the hands of the very few, but also the less palpable shift or change in the structure of time and temporal experience when nothing is allowed to be carried over from year to year, when one growing season is not allowed to teach, inform, or color the next. David Pontassel, describing his work cross-pollinating wild and cultivated varieties of sunflower at West Jackson Plant Institute, inadvertently triggers the same pathos, the sense of time having been cheated of its course, left hanging, kept from bearing fruit, in his image of the ripe seed, uselessly left on the stalk, rather than dispersed by the wind. A good example, this is David von Tassel, a good example is mutations that disrupt seed dispersal, leaving the seeds on the heads long after they are ripe. An individual expressing this trait, known as shadow resistance, would have reduced fitness in the wild, but it is precisely the kind of plant we are looking for. Shadow resistance is an absolute requirement for a grain crop because once grain falls to the ground, it is virtually impossible for the farmer to recover it. In this sense, there is a tiny element of truth to what Richard Dawkins and others like to repeat, that there is nothing new about GM crops. For the imaginative terror induced by these new lines of copyrighted creatures designed to be both endlessly replaceable and permanently non-generative, simply makes louder the unease one might, read, one might feel reading Colin Duncan's account of the enforced perpetual use and the constant struggle against other avenues of growth constituted by the annual harvesting of seeds. Duncan is a socialist historian of agriculture, and this is his account of early annual farming. The commonly adopted course is to populate the ecosystem with fast-growing, immature species communities. These tend to comprise annuals or other species that are destroyed in the act of being harvested. The great trouble with annuals is the task of re-establishing the community afresh every year. Moreover, the annual crop approach thus implies a long period when the ecological niches are left vacant between harvest and the maturation of the next crop. This is a time of especially great vulnerability to invasion by other plants and, and animals. Typically, a community composed of only one species is introduced by humans into land made botanically empty by burning, plowing, or some other destructive technique. There follows the constant battle to keep this absurdly unstable community in possession of the land in question. Note how this description of early agriculture attributes to it what we tend to associate with late capitalist modernity, the logic of permanent obsolescence, whereby nothing is allowed to grow old. Yet it would not be fair to Duncan's argument simply to cite his critique of early agriculture for instituting biotic communities that can never complete a full ecological cycle. Listen to the role not only of diurnal and annual difference, but of shifting roles and displaceable boundaries in his description of the 18th century Norfolk system of four course rotation, where sheep were used as mobile fertilizer factories. You get the sense that the lines being drawn between willed growth and excluded wilderness are also constantly being redrawn, with the flexibility or capacity for provisional accommodation, according to which X can play the role of one thing at one moment and the role of something else at another. By day, the sheep extracted nutrients from grassy hillsides, bringing them down in their guts to the arable fields, 
where they were folded by night. The sheep were made to excrete these same nutrients over the entire field over a sequence of night, as the sheepfolds, actually movable fences, were systematically resituated every day. For Duncan, these crop rotation cycles became part of the very stuff of rural life, and it requires of us perhaps a special effort to understand that the perception of loss when the system passed away was not merely sentimental. The farmers' plans were not conceived of as something to alter year by year. Rather, they were embedded in the longer, inevitable cycles of climate. And for those of you who were here this morning, I hope you can hear the resonance with Elaine's uh, point about the difference between rice that takes 110 days to grow versus uh, twice, nearly twice that, or um, more than twice that time. So now with this process, I want to turn to the subject of my paper proper, the loves of the plants in an age of colony collapse disorder. It will seem that I'm leaping to something wildly disconnected, but I hope it will be clear by the end that I'm interested in tracking in the crisis known to us as colony collapse. The same risk-averse denial of contingency and mistrust of accidental offspring, the same foreclosure of what time may chance to do or not, and the same indifference to seasonal specificity and temporal variation as can be ascribed to Monsanto's insistence that each year shall be as the first and hence identical to the last. In his posthumously published and never finished botanical dictionary, the 18th century philosopher and amateur botan botanist Jean-Jacques Rousseau offers the following anti-essentializing definition of flower as a name not for some solid substantive entity, but, as a but for a relative window of time in which the plant is fertile. The general fault of prior definitions lies in having too often considered the flower as an absolute substance whereas it is only, it seems to me, a collective and relative being. Accordingly, the flower appears to me to be no more than the passing state of the parts of simplification during the fertilization or pollination of the seed. The flower is therefore not only the, only, is therefore only the threshold and instrument of fertilization, the flower is the local and passing part of the plant that precedes fertilization of the germ and by which or through which it operates. Only one must not take too strictly the word during that I've used, for even before the fertilization of the germ has begun, one can say that the flower exists as soon as the sexual organs are evident, that is, as soon as the corolla has blossomed, and ordinarily the anthers don't open themselves to the seminal dust from the moment that the corolla opens itself to the anthers. Nevertheless, fertilization cannot begin before the anthers have opened. One must thus necessarily give a little bit of extension to the word during, to be able to say that the flower and the work of fertilization begin and end together. There's much to say about the indeterminacy of this during, which requires a little extension, which must be granted some leeway of indeterminate length on either end, and whose parameters cannot be strictly defined. The slight decalage or time lag between the opening of the corolla and the release of pollinating dust from the anthers represents a temporal gap that is stretchable but not infinitely so. This temporal disaccord should have been a clue that most plants do not self-fertilize, but rely on insects and wind for cross-pollination. It's as if the temporal gap in the readiness of one part of the plant and that of another cancels the spatial proximity at which Charles Darwin will wonder a few decades later. How strange that the pollen and stigmatic surface of the same flower, though placed so close together as if for the very purpose of self-fertilization, should in so many cases be mutually useless to each other. <laughs> Such mutual uselessness was not apparent, however, to most 18th century botanists. Indeed, according to Alexander Crook and François de Laporte, in the 1770s, when Rousseau is composing the dictionary, the general consensus is that hermaphroditism, that is, the presence of both female and male sexual parts on the same flower, implies self-fertilization. In his book, The Second Order of Nature, de la Porte argues that excitement at the discovery of plant sexuality and ongoing efforts to prove the existence of what Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather, called the loves of the plants, left 18th century botanists with little interest in the seemingly accidental possibility of insect pollination. Only late in the century did the German botanist Kornleuter and Schengel, observing the different times of maturity of stamens and pistils, begin developing the theory of insect pollination. 
Until then, according to de la Porte, the bisexuality of plants is understood to be a consequence of their fixity or immobility. Since they can't travel to others, they must be self-sufficient. We know from Erasmus Darwin's poem the fanciful constructions to which this exclusive emphasis on autogamy or self-marriage leads. Some kind of downward inclination from female to male has to be imagined in the cases of flowers whose pistols are taller than their stamens. The female of the Ecobolium augustifolium, rose bay willow, bends down amongst the males for several days and becomes upright again when impregnated. Or there's the American cowslip, five males and one female. The pistil is much longer than the stamens, hence the flower stalks have their elegant bend, that the stigma may hang downwards to receive the fecundating dust of the anthers. As de Lepoft argues, the increasing prevalence of indoor experiments on hothouse, easily movable, and most importantly, isolatable plants only serve to confirm these assumptions, while the mistrust of chance, the unwillingness to believe that a provident creator could have left so important a function as reproduction in the hands of ignorant and aleatory intermediaries, made the possibility of insect pollination appear just that, a surprising and atypical contingency, a happy second chance or backup plant, plan for unisexual or dioxic plants, but not the norm. Insects in the wind were perceived, according to De La Porte, as responsible for hybrids and dismissed as delivering disorder uncertain agents. He cites the German naturalist Friedrich Wilhelm Leichen imagining insects as so little versed in the mysteries of botany that they would bring the pollen of a vile squash flower to the precious flower of a melon. Mm. And then he cites the surprise of Portler to, I was surprised when I made for the first time the discovery in one of these plants of that they were pollinated by insects, and when I saw that nature had left so important a matter of reproduction to a single chance, a happy accident. So the question that I actually should have asked my, my co-colleagues yesterday was, was how this must have resonated for um, farmers who had been depending on dependent on insect pollination for centuries before these academic 18th century botanists began making these claims for a very short period of time in the 18th century. Um, my one sort of evidence of some other way of understanding the proximity or the relationship between the presence of insects in the spring and the setting of fruit later in the season is this father from the 17th century, a swarm of bees in May is worth a load of hay, but a swarm in July is not worth a fly. So part two, colony collapse. In the time that remains, I want to make a case for the continuity between this underestimation of aleatory factors as unreliable and incapable of doing the job well, or efficiently, or at all times, and the contemporary ecological crisis known as colony collapse disorder, or bee die -off. The shortest way for me to put the following argument will be to say that the illusions of the 18th century have become reality today. Colony collapse disorder it is or was the term given the mysterious syndrome whereby entire hives of pollinating bees have been disappearing without a trace overnight. Organic beekeepers are fond of claiming that colony collapse is only a symptom of a market-driven system of agriculture long since gone awry. And indeed, it is impossible to tell this story without also telling one of ongoing political enclosure, ecological disruption, and aesthetic homogenization. In her 2000 New Yorker, 2007 New Yorker piece, Elizabeth Colbert describes how modern agriculture has evolved to depend on the surfaces, surfaces of Apismela fera, a thorough generalist, polyectic, not particular. Colbert's term evolved repeats a pernicious naturalization of the hardly inevitable process by which 500-acre apple orchards have become the norm. In an orchard of such a size, there simply aren't enough indigenous pollinators to produce a commercial crop. Either the yield will be too low or the fruit will be small or stunted. Since, as Colbert writes, two men can easily move 10 million bees into an orchard in a single day, the same bees may begin by pollinating apples in Pennsylvania, move on to blueberries in Maine, then to Clover in New York, and back to pumpkin, pumpkins again in Pennsylvania. And these are the interstate trucked bees um, that provide this weird kind of shepherd's calendar of various flowering seasons. <laughs> Uh, if you've seen these documentaries on colony collapse, then it's always an interesting moment. As commercial beekeepers like David Hackenberg like to point out, 
The same economy of large-scale industrial monocrops that demands a ready supply of removable pollinators also gives commercial beekeepers little choice to do anything else, since domestic honey cannot compete with cheap corn syrup or honey imports. Constant transportation not only stresses the bees, Colbert's informant tells him he expects to lose 10% of his queen simply as a result of the jostling on the highway, but leaves them no time to make sufficient honey to feed themselves or their young, so that their diet has to be supplemented with the very sweeteners that have turned them migrant workers in the first place. According to Gunjar Kauk, modern beekeepers will not in any case risk a gap or interval by letting the queens die. Those following the conventional manuals automatically replace the queen in at most two years, a process that each time requires reintroducing the worker bees to a new queen on a shorter and less flexible time cycle than they would ordinarily follow. I hope this quick sketch sufficiently renders the paradox that I want to emphasize, that of the system of agricultural production that has been brought to the breaking point, rendered terribly and ironically fragile by its own intolerance of vulnerability, its terror of being dependent on something it cannot control, such as seasons, weather, or the life cycles of other creatures, its presupposition of the equivalence of different temporal cycles, and its general mistrust of leaving things to chance or to secondary functions, that is, of taking the risk of having X accomplished only in the course of doing something else. We are, in other words, very far from the leniency and flexibility for which we'll still beg when it comes to measuring the exact length of his flower hour. So here's my, here are two examples of how 21st century industrial monocultures have made a reality of 18th century illusions. In the last few years, genetics has introduced into California, which has the largest share in worldwide commercial almond crops, a new variety of self-pollinating almond trees, fittingly called Independence, PM. When these trees were being treated for their self-compatibility, they had to be netted, in effect isolated from the bees that were once used to fructify them. The contradiction to be pondered is why the insistence on the porousness and manipulability of species boundaries through genetic manipulation should simultaneously coincide with the terrifying impoverishment of interaction between species and an investment in careful immunization from temporal evolution, as if the norm for each creature were to be under quarantine from others. De La Porte at one point intimates that it was by analogy to human manipulation that the idea of insect pollination dawned as a real possibility, so that humans and insects were always analogous to one another as artificial third-party intermediaries. This too finds itself weirdly inverted and literalized today in the image of women in pear trees doing the work once performed by bees. Since the mid-1980s, pear orchard keepers in the Sichuan province of China have been resorting to hand pollination because, have, because have pesticide use has wiped out the local insect pollinators. I will skip over many of the striking details pertaining to this short-term, labor-intensive process that takes humans 400 hours to do what bees could accomplish in an afternoon, and that relies on what may itself be a temporary condition in a rapidly organizing Chinese economy, the ready availability of human labor. But there is one detail to, that brings us back to Rousseau's figure of the extendable, but not infinitely so, flower hour, whereas bees only inadvertently drop pollen in the right place at the right time in the course of doing something else, gathering nectar, hand pollinators cannot afford to leave accurate timings chance and must first learn to tell the stigma's receptivity to pollination by the color of the anthers, or, which is easier, by the degree of openness of the petals. According to differing weather conditions, this window of receptivity will be over within three hot sunny days, in which case the rate of pay will sometimes double, or last up to ten if cloudy and cool. Now I'll just conclude. Earlier I cited Rousseau's definition of flower as a collective and relative being and a way to designate a brief window of fertile opportunity whose length is never exactly the same. Herbarium images are precisely not flowers, according to Rousseau's definition, although they may be images of this time lapse. So I have here, this is um, Zanichele palustris, or horned pondweed, and there's another one. Veronica Scutellata or Mark Speedwell. These are both from Rousseau's own herbarium. I chose these two images because they seem to retain traces of the plant's exposure to and dependence on proximate external elements, the way the wind or water may have bent them in a certain direction 
or cause them to move in a certain way. Although, of course, this may be an optical illusion created by the placement of the plant on the press. In conversation last summer, a fellow literary critic, Deidre Lynch, suggested to me that what you were looking at are not mimetic representations or even indexical photographs, but in Jeremy Bentham's terms, auto-icons, even if icons are so, so diminished, the untrained eye may have a hard time detecting the original. Like Dickinson's posthumously lyricized writings, their isolation on the blank page lends them an autonomy they never had. <coughs> But even this supposed independence from external elements, most especially from the unimaginable touch of time, turns out to be illusory. The archivist in the Chatel explained to me that manual handling of the pages and specimens in the herbarium is now so destructive to them, the library is considering locking it up in a box that would be reopened. Thank you.